So we've heard a lot of threats from Iran. Over the past few weeks, they basically threw 1,001 warnings to Israel and the United States. There were talks of oil embargoes, a food blockade, and more fronts opening. But none of that ever happened, and now it seems that the Iranians are starting to back away. And we have to analyze this. Is this just a hate fake, or has Iran truly given up? They were the most vocal of the entire Arab world, so if Iran backs down, does this mean escalations will die down as well? In our lead story today, Iran's axis of resistance against Israel faces trial by fire. According to this report, it suggests that Iran isn't going to get involved in the conflict. Now, if that's true, then a big risk is taken off the table. A chess piece is taken off the board. Now, it doesn't mean things won't escalate, but it likely won't be Iran's fault. Remember, this might actually be misdirection, so we have to be critical of whatever we read. And here's what Iran's supreme leader said to the head of Hamas. You gave us no warning of your October 7 attack on Israel, and we will not enter the war on your behalf. And it seems Iran had no knowledge of the attack beforehand. They'll continue to lend political and moral support, but they won't intervene directly. In addition, the Ayatollah told Hamas to stop asking Iran and Hezbollah to join the battle against Israel. So it seems things might be fracturing between Hamas and Iran, and we won't see rockets coming from Tehran anytime soon. But why is this happening? I think we need to realize that three breaking events happened that essentially took oxygen away from the room. Now, the first was during the recent Arab summit. We know Iran wants the Arab world to severe all ties with Israel, but that was blocked during the summit. The UAE plans to maintain ties with Israel. Saudi Arabia is also going to maintain relations with Israel. All the countries that signed the Abraham Accords aren't going to break rank either. So Iran's facing a wall of resistance, especially from the head of OPEC and the biggest economic powers in the Gulf. You can throw any embargoes, any oil embargoes out of the window at this point. Now the next one's very interesting. It's a move by the United States to calm Iran down, and it all revolves around money. Joe Biden has extended a sanctions waiver that allows Iran to access around $10 billion from Iraq. The waiver allows Iraq to purchase electricity from Iran, and this means $10 billion in Iraqi payments could be shifted away to neutral banks for Iran to be used. Now the US says that the money can only be used for humanitarian purposes, but money is fungible, right? Iran really likes this because now their domestic revenue can be shifted to fund their proxies or to pursue their nuclear programs. Iran obviously wants to keep the money flowing, so rocking the boat isn't a good idea. It was Anthony Blinken who signed the deal and it will last for 4 months. The US probably sees this conflict ending within a few months and this is a delay tactic to keep Iran out of the fray. So we are seeing a lot of wheeling and dealing happening behind the scenes. I think Biden and friends realizes that things are getting out of hand. If they don't calm the situation now, if Iran snaps and joins in, this war will bankrupt the United States. Now it gets even more interesting. Let's bite into the juicy stuff. The former Iranian foreign minister is warning Iran not to get lured into joining the war. According to him, Israel wants to expand the Gaza conflict in order to drag the US into the fighting. And this is something that even America wants to avoid. Just look at all the headlines, 500 US officials protesting Biden's Israel policy. People within the administration itself are revolting against continued US support. And it gets worse when you look at the situation on the ground. US public support for Israel is dropping. In a Reuters poll, 68% of people want a ceasefire and for Israel to start negotiations. Wars are won not just on the ground but from public opinion as well. There isn't any need for Iran to interfere and muddy the waters because if they do, then all bets are off. The moment they directly attack US troops, it will become an American conflict. But that doesn't mean we are out of the woods yet. The Middle East is still in big trouble. Iran isn't in full control of their proxies. Just because they are holding back and they are keeping calm doesn't mean the rest of the Arab world is. The network of Iranian-backed groups goes well beyond Tehran. With Hezbollah in the north still bombing Israel, there are hotspots in Syria and Iraq attacking US bases as well. But the real challenge now comes with the Houthis in the south just below Saudi Arabia. The Houthis today are becoming increasingly vocal and their leader has made a shocking statement. He says the group will start targeting Israeli ships in the Red Sea. Now this is a big escalation point because Yemen is located next to a shipping choke point just below the Suez Canal. Now it's not as critical as the Strait of Hormuz but it is still a significant supply route. If the Houthis carried out this threat, this will disrupt global trade. It won't just be oil tankers passing through here but commercial shipping vessels as well. 
we'll see more supply chain disruptions, oil prices could head up, and inflation from the supply side will reignite. So the whole region is still a big powder keg waiting to explode. And there's a breaking update that I have to share. The UN Security Council has adopted a resolution. They are calling for urgent humanitarian pauses and corridors, but Israel isn't too happy about it. At the same time, this isn't exactly a ceasefire either. So this pause could last for weeks or just days to get aid in, restore services and get people out. It is still not a ceasefire and until that happens, things are still on the edge of disaster. But let's shift focus to the United States because things are starting to break down with the Chinese. Now we all hope for things to start moving in a good direction, in the right direction during the meeting. But it was actually going quite well. Biden even did a throwback, reminding Xi Jinping of his younger days back in America. He whipped out his phone and showed a younger picture of Xi in front of the Golden Gate Bridge. But things quickly ended on a very bad note with Biden, calling President Xi a dictator during a media conference. Now sure, there was some progress made such as restoring military communications, but optics matter, they absolutely matter. It's the same gaffe made after Blinken's trip to Beijing. It's really counterproductive because it doesn't help the situation. It all boils down to the Chinese concept of giving face, which Biden didn't observe. You have seen the look on Blinken's face when Biden made the comment, right? He was literally ready to resign. Now, there wasn't anything big or substantial that came out. The most dangerous issue is still Taiwan, and that ranks even above the economic problems, which there are a ton of. President Xi told Joe Biden to stop interfering in the Taiwan issue. The US side should stop arming Taiwan and support China's peaceful reunification. China will realize reunification, and this is unstoppable. And it's clear as day that this is China's red line. It's on par, even exceeds China's concerns with their economy. This is going to be a real tough pill to swallow for the United States. But if they truly want better relations with China, America might have to reduce military support for Taiwan, which I doubt will happen. In a story from Bloomberg, US raises munitions equipment aid for Taiwan to $480 million. The funds can be used to buy arms as well as coastal and air defense systems. It's basically money to buy stuff from the military industrial complex. This is money that directly contributes to US GDP. So will the US really pull this away? I'm not so sure. Part of Biden's $100 billion request is funding to the Indo-Pacific, right? Which includes support for Taiwan. So we can immediately see the red line China is throwing down. If Biden gets his money and he throws Taiwan a billion dollars or $2 billion, this won't go down well with the Chinese. We have come to the point where China is probably going to ignore what America says and judge them based on actions alone. And this brings us down to America's daily fiscal situation, right? Can they continue to fund Taiwan or even Ukraine? Because we are now reaching a point where even funding Zelensky is becoming impossible. In a shocking report, the US only has $1 billion left for weapons to aid Ukraine. Biden wants to replenish that with $61 billion more, but Congress is still in turmoil. The State Department wants the money to keep flowing, but the House wants to push aid to Israel first. So there's a lot of infighting going on and this puts Ukraine in a deadly position. And let's just assume they'll get a full $61 billion. That will likely be the last tranche of money they'll get. The US fiscal position is on shaky ground. Bond yields are still high and Moody's is on the verge of downgrading US debt to AA plus from AAA. Now if Moody's downgrades America's credit rating, this will force bond yields to reprice up, especially if it comes from the money being sent to Ukraine. The cost of borrowing for America will rise throughout the economy. So there's a political and economic limit to how much Biden can send Ukraine. This means we could see a resolution come to the Ukraine war and it will be initiated by the party that goes broke first. A Eurozone plan to spend $20 billion on military aid for Zelensky is also meeting resistance. It's not just Hungary that's opposing this, but Germany also has a lot of questions to ask. Western support for Ukraine is starting to slip because economic reality is starting to catch up. Putin is beginning to outlast the West because the world still needs Russian commodities. The sanctions are not working. From Bloomberg, Russia's cash inflow gains momentum as oil exports recover. The October surplus exceeded $11 billion for the second straight month. And this is money that will be used to keep the war effort going. Russia's current account have been in surplus throughout the entire year. And until this goes negative, there aren't any risks of dropping out. Because oil prices soared in Q3, their hard currency reserves are starting to build up again. So the West has to ante up. 
and they'll need to do it soon or Ukraine will be in big trouble. Russia's going to increase their war budget. Putin's going to allocate almost 30% of their 2024 budget towards defense. It's an all-in poker move to force the West to either double down on the debt crisis or give up on Ukraine. Now, I believe that the US will still fund Ukraine well into 2024. It won't look good for Biden politically if he doesn't, right? The economy is still in shambles and keeping the Ukraine fight might be his last chance at re-election. Let's not forget how war spending adds to the GDP numbers as well. So this will help to prop up the US economy. We gotta keep those GDP numbers in the positive, right? But let's end this with Netanyahu's warning to the West because it's really creepy. In an interview with Fox, he warned America that if Israel doesn't win now, then Europe is next and the United States is next. He's still hammering away saying, there's no place in Gaza we won't reach. So things are reaching the point of no return. Iran, they might be backing down, but if things go too far, we'll see the crisis spread even further and explode into a regional war. There's a lot of resentment building up in the Arab world today, and it all takes just one wrong move to destabilize the entire region, to destroy everything. But let me know what you think in the comments below. Is Iran really out of the war? And will US-China relations really improve? Let me know in the comments below. Stay safe, be sure to smash the like button and subscribe as we navigate through these crazy times.